Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man's Dame here with me. How we doing today, Dame? How we feeling? I'm all right, man. I'm all right. I'm a little, little, little pain. My Lakers got got blown out, but you know, I I called it before the game. I knew we was gonna lose, but I, I'm good. They you know what I'm saying? I, I like a comment and subscribe would make me feel a little bit better, though. <laughs> yeah. So, like you said, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Tell them about the new TikTok. You know, we're going multi-platform these days. Oh yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah. you know, I got I got to shout out the TikTok real quick. We got we made a TikTok account for the podcast. If you want to check that out, just for some some clips and stuff like that. Is the Off the Glass podcast? That's what it's called on TikTok. Listen, you can go up there, watch some funny videos. We got we got some clips up there. Make sure you like them. You know, follow the follow the TikTok. You know, tap in, tap in with us. Yep, see, we getting the shorts put out on this channel as well. So we we getting getting creative out here, getting, getting multi platform for sure. Right, right. Um, you know, as as you said, get the housekeeping out the way. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Our socials are going to be in the description. Be sure to follow us on there. I mean, my channel is going to be in the description as well. Be sure to comment and subscribe over there too. Um, if I sound a little off today, I am a little under the weather, so I'm out here having a flu game this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. Uh. Great couple of days of basketball here last night, especially the Phoenix game was crazy. Devin Booker, honestly, if Jimmy Butler hasn't been having the, the first round that he did and didn't go for that 56-point game, I think D-Book would clear-cut be the best playoff performer this year. Easily. Um, this is, what, his third 40-point game this playoffs, right? I, bro, I don't even know. It seems like every other game he's going for 40-plus, man. It's crazy. Um and so I, let's just dive right into that game because well, I'm looking at the box score again right now. 20 of 25 from the field, 47 points. The man shot two free throws, and that was literally at the end of the game when just to, you know, close stuff out when they're trying to foul. Mm-hmm. And up until that point, the only person on the Suns who had shot free throws was Kevin Durant. So this man scored 47 on 25 shots. It sounds like a, a KD stat line. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, that was crazy efficient. Crazy yeah. efficient. And uh all game, like from the tip basically, he had it going, was getting to his spots. He just looked like he was in such a good rhythm. Um, you know, they didn't really have a way to stop him from getting his shot in the mid-range, um, you know, working off of ball screens, fadeaways out of the post, like anything he wanted yesterday, he he could get it. Um, and, you know, that's what you want to see when you, again, construct a team this way with two, you know, highly efficient lethal scores in, in D. Book and Kevin Durant. So on any given night, you can get, you know, 40 out of either of them. And, and last night they basically got 40 out of both. Um, and, and the Suns were able to to get one back here in this series in, in the first game on their home floor. But still only a seven point win for them, you know, with, you know, the two of them combining for. It was over 80 points. 86. 86, 86 points. Yeah. 86 of the 121 <laughs> points. 86 out of two people. Damn. Yeah, oh, and they combined God. for for 17 of the 24 assists. So only, like, they are only not accounting for, what, 15 or so points? They're the entire offense. Like, right. they're, they're the entire team right now. Like, it, it's crazy. It's honestly insane. Yeah, so he – Booker was insane last night. KD – Definitely struggling to shoot, as he has for much of this series so far, which has been interesting to watch. I feel like I haven't seen him have this much trouble, especially from an efficiency standpoint. Um, but he definitely made a concerted effort. It looked like really going into the second quarter of that game to just, like, put his head down, get to the rim and draw, you know, draw contact, get some fouls. And, um, you know, obviously I said he 14 or 16 from the line. It was the only person on that team with free throws up until the last, you know, 15 seconds of that game. So. Uh, that contributed in a huge way for them. Um, also got to shout out Monty Williams. In this game, if you look, um, T.J. Warren played 26 minutes, had some huge um, buckets for them, especially down the stretch there. He was actually was a plus 20 off the bench. Um, mm-hmm. And I, we can honestly dive into this here because I know we talked about it off the pod. We talked about it earlier on the pod. Um, man, DeAndre Ayton looked horrible. <laughs> Man, DeAndre, bro, I don't know what to say about this guy, bro. Former number one overall pick. Like, he just, 
I don't know. I'm not a fan, to be honest. But DeAndre Ayton is just he's just not it, bro. He's just not it. I, I know I talked about it last time with, you know, being at game two, you know, you see Chris Paul leave. As soon as he left, it felt like DeAndre Ayton's presence left the court too at the same time. Mm-hmm. or whatever of it was there to begin with, you know? So coming into this game, I was, you know, this is what I was expecting um, because he just doesn't get, and some of it isn't all his fault, right? Like at the end of the day, he doesn't always get those touches. And obviously some of that is scheme. Like you feel like, you know, D book has you know so much time on the ball. Same thing with Kevin Durant um, that where, when, when is a going to get a touch in the post, but at the same time, He's not rolling super hard to the rim. When he does, he's not finishing aggressively. I'm looking at him get stuffed by Jamal Murray. He's not, you know, these are opportunities that he has to dunk the ball, to finish strong, get in ones through contact. He's not doing it well. He's not rebounding well. He's not checking Jokic well. And, you know, throughout most of the the second and third quarter, um, you know, Monty Williams went to to Jock Landale off the bench. And he played significantly better. It was much more scrappy. Um, you can even just see on, like, out-of-bounds plays, he's getting physical with Jokic, trying to get, you know, his body up into him um, and, and try to disrupt him any way that he can in ways that Aiton just is not. And that's just an effort thing at that point. Like, there's no – if you just look at athleticism and skill set, like, Aiton is miles ahead of Jock Landell in that department. Right. In terms of just – that's just pure effort and just, you know, wanting to exert that – for 20, 25 minutes a game um, to give your team what you have to try to slow down a two-time MVP. Um, and I think the sequence in the fourth that really got Aiden bench for the rest of this game um, was he blew a layup on, on Jamal Murray on one end, came down the other side of the court, uh, didn't get the rebound on the first one, got it tipped, got the rebound, and then immediately got it ripped, I think, by Aaron Gordon um, and lost the possession there for the Suns. Um, and then you can even hear on the broadcast, Richard Jefferson was like, and Jock Landale just got off the bench. My Monty Williams is like, I've seen enough. As just a fan, I've seen enough. Like, I know he had the whole contract dispute, you know, with being a restricted free agent. He had signed the deal in Indiana and the Suns matched. And so I'm, I'm sure there's still some animosity there. And we saw animosity, you know, in previous years between him and Monty Williams and, you know, some of the minutes that he played in the postseason. But look, man, like, at the end of the day, you're a part of this big core that they've, they've put together in Phoenix. And without Chris Paul, like you would expect, you've got to be able to step up and do more. And if, again, if like on a night like this, when your offensive presence as a scorer it could be helpful, but like is not needed. Like you need to be able to shine in other areas. You need to be fighting for rebounds. You need to be making an impact on the defensive end. And you're not doing that like, at all. Right. Um, so I, I think I tweeted out, I genuinely would not be shocked um, if he got benched. Like, if I'm Monty Williams, that's something I would seriously consider. Um, because, again, like I said, you don't need him to put up a ton of points. Again, it would be helpful, but, you know, it feels like we're scratching and clawing for him to put up any points at all. And so um, that coupled with, him being a negative right now in terms of rebounding in the defensive end, I would much rather if I'm the Suns coach play Jock Landale more minutes, get him up to like 30 minutes a game. Obviously you're still going to bring in DeAndre Aiden and potentially, um, you know, Bismack as well. Um, you know, if people get into foul trouble, but um, I think he found something in those minutes there with Jock and I'd expect to see more and potentially move him into the starting lineup because what Aiden is doing right now is not going to cut it. My biggest problem with DeAndre Ayton, like you said, it's not the fact that you're not scoring. It's not the fact that – I mean, it's bad that you're missing open layups. It's bad that you're not being aggressive on the offensive end. But like you said, it's the it's the fact that you're not doing the stuff that I need my big man to do. A lot of the dirty work as far as rebounding, hustling, defending. Like, I understand you're not going to stop Jokic. Like, no one's going to stop Jokic. But I, it just seems like you're out there. You're just a liability. Like, you're not even really trying. Mm-hmm. Like, when, when you don't have – we don't get the post touches as a big man. The only way you're going to get the touches is if you go get it. If you go get those offensive rebounds, if you go get those rebounds, like, they will reward you. Every every big man that hustles, that gets the offensive rebounds, that does all the dirty work, eventually you will get rewarded. And especially on this team where we only really have two scores, basically. Like, if you do all the dirty work, I'm pretty sure you will get rewarded on the offensive end. So that's my biggest problem with DeAndre Ayton. It's just 
he seemed like he doesn't have that motor. Like he doesn't want to do that dirty work that I need my big man to do. So uh, it's real tough. Like I said, he definitely could get benched just because right now it's just, what do you really bring to the team? What do you really bring to the table? Like it's, Nothing, it's no, it's bro. yeah, it's like, it's kind of pointless to have you out there right now. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he got benched, especially because his history with Monty, like they butted heads a little bit. So mm -hmm. Um, I definitely wouldn't be surprised. It's funny too, cause he re like when I watch him play, he reminds me of like Anthony Davis on his off days. Like when Anthony Davis doesn't have it going, like, but that's like DeAndre Aiden all the time. Right. right? Cause when, when AD <laughs> doesn't have it going, it's like he's not really hustling for rebounds either. He still mm -hmm. like block shots. He plays good defense, but like him with no motor is just DeAndre Aiden, and like that's sad because, like I said, you're the former number one overall pick. Like people keep talking about this potential. Like people have been talking about his potential for years. Like I feel like, but we've seen point, flashes of it, right? Like that. That's yeah. it's in the their run to the finals, right? Like <clears throat> dominating. Like that was a thing for like, you know <laughs> spurt to that yeah. that playoff run. Um, and he had some huge games for them, even in the finals of that. You know, against Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like, bro, where did this player go? Like it felt like the progression just stopped. And if anything, you regressed up until this point like again you know the the, the shot diet is not going to be there when you add a guy like Kevin Durant but it's the other aspects of your game just do not seem to have an as much of an impact on the floor as they should again like you said being a former number one overall pick and at the end of the day like with what we've seen from you in the past like you are capable of doing it but you have like your team needs you in these moments because they're not going to get out of this series like without him stepping up or one of the big stepping up because again like I like I alluded to earlier right like 86 combined points from your star duo and you win by seven like Denver took all of those punches and if a couple of different things go their way down the stretch this could be a 3-0 series right that that's really the problem is the fact that you like that 86 combined points was much needed it wasn't like they needed every single one of those points to, right. sneak, to squeak out of there with a win so it's tough because it's like i understand you add kevin durant to the mix i understand some shot like shots are going to go his way i understand you're going to get um significantly less opportunities to score the basketball but it's like i mean like j even if you just look at the box score you obviously you got 47 you got 39 from kd and no one else is even in double digits you have no chris paul on the floor it's like you would think you can get opportunities to score the basketball so I don't know. That's just, I don't know. It's, it's real interesting to me how he's just a non factor offensively and defensively. Yeah. And this is, has been a problem that people have had with Phoenix as a whole, like aside from Aiden alone, right? Like the ball gets held up so much in D books and KD's hands. Um, and even prior to KD getting there, like just Aiden just doesn't see those kinds of touches. And mm -hmm. some of that is probably like that's a, you know, uh, concerted effort by you know their scheme like they don't see him getting post touches as something that's conducive to how they want their offense to run and that's fair I guess I would disagree um because again I think the skill set is there for that to provide just a different dynamic to their offense but again with no Chris Paul it's like his presence yet gets diminished more and more um so yeah I like they're gonna need him to step up or I mean, I, I, it's wild to say like Jock Landale to step up even more, um, you know, for them to even get, they got like, even to get game four on their home floor, like they're in danger zone every single night. Um, because even when, again, your stars are combining for 86 points and their D book is having like historic playoff performances. Y'all are still only squeaking out wins against this Nuggets team at mm -hmm. home. <laughs> Yeah, I, exactly. If, if this game was in Denver, I don't think they won this game. No, probably not. But then that's why at this point you know, it looks like they're probably going to lose in five because it's you. T it takes this much of a great game from Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, even though he didn't have a an efficient night, um, he still gave you thirty nine points. Yeah. Like, just to only win by seven at home is just it, it's insane. That's why it the Suns team just isn't it isn't a contender. It looks like right now. Yeah, and, and Jokic had a huge game, you know, 30-point triple-double, the 30-17-17, and 17, uh, six offensive rebounds. Jamal Murray had it going for most of the game up until, like, the last four minutes where he just looked absolutely gassed. All of his shots were coming up short. 
Um, Aaron Gordon had a rough go for it from a shooting perspective, but, you know, his hustle on both ends of the floor, rebound, and his defense um, was huge in this game, as it has been, you know, this entire postseason run. He's done a phenomenal job. Um, they lost the bench minutes um, big time in this game, which hurt them. All of their bench players were um, a negative. I think Jeff Green was a minus 20 plus minus. Uh, Bruce Brown was a minus 14, which is tough. You know, the, the on-off numbers for Jokic have been staggering all season long. Um, been better in the, in the postseason, but um, this game, they definitely lost the, the Jokic minutes, uh, especially in the second half, um, which hurt them a lot down the stretch. But yeah, like I said, a couple of different things go the Nuggets' way. And, you know, we're looking at a 3-0 series lead and the Suns are one game away from being swept. So, um, I think I said last time on the pod, I think Nuggets in five is where the series is trending. And I still feel that way even after this game because how sustainable is what we saw last night from Phoenix? And if they're able to do it, like, you got to just tip your cap to that at that point because, like – as easy as it is for D book, like some of that is just like, he's that good. Right. Like he right. can get to his spots because they're not, not trying, right. Like Bruce Brown is giving great effort. They're trying to make him work. And I think there's different things they could do schematically to make it even harder for him. But at the end of the day, like both of these guys are knocking down tough mid range shots consistently. Like you have to kind of just tip your cap at some point. So I don't think it's sustainable if they're able to do it for a few more games and extend the series further than, than maybe, but, you know, barring some huge revelation here by DeAndre Ayton or one of their bigs or, or Chris Paul is able to come back and have some crazy performance. Like I just don't see a way for Phoenix to get it done, you know, just with their lack of depth, their issues defending. There's just too many holes in this roster that cannot just be patched over by 86 points. Yeah. Um, I, I do have a question. Do you feel like Kevin Durant's um inefficiency is a cause for concern? Because it's if you really if you think about it, even like going back to last year's playoffs, they get swept by Boston and Katie struggles a lot. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people kind of chalked it up to Boston was just a great defensive team. They had length, they can get physical with them, so make them be uncomfortable. Then you go into the first round series of this playoffs, he didn't he didn't have a bad series, but it just it's funny how we even talked about it on the podcast, like Devin Booker, like the number one over there, like Kevin mm -hmm. Durant. He gets his 25, 26, but it's not the normal, like, it, he didn't look like the normal Kevin Durant. Like, he looked like the second guy over there. And yeah. then you come to this series, um, what was it, game two, he struggled from the field, had a bad shooting night. And then even when he scores 39 points, it's like, what do you shoot, like, eight for 24 or something like that? Like, it, was, it wasn't a Kevin Durant type of 39 points. Like you said, like, Devin Booker's shooting 80%. That's normally what Kevin Durant does. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting because I don't know if this is – um, a concern moving forward with Kevin Durant? It just seems like it's just very uncharacteristic right now. Yeah, and I think some of that is definitely credit to to Aaron Gordon, how they talked about on the broadcast, right? Like, he's got the the physical attributes that you would want and someone to guard KD, like long, mm -hmm. um, you know, strong, and obviously has the, the athleticism to be able to keep up with him. Um, so I, I think he's definitely disrupted him. If you look at his last two games, you know, uh, in the regular season, he was 50-40-90. He's 50, 56, 40, 90, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, um, last two games, he was 37 from the field, 16% from three. Last night, he was 38% from the field, 20% from three. Um, so I think some of that you've got to tip your cap to, to Aaron Gordon. Um, I think that'll pick up, right? I just can't imagine a world where we just see an, a full series of, of an inefficient KD. I don't even know what that would look like. I mean, we've seen him before. Last year, when he played with uh, against Boston, he didn't have a great series pretty much that whole time. I can't remember if he had one game in that series. I was like, okay, that's really that's Kevin Durant. You know what I'm saying? That's the only reason why I feel like um, if last year didn't happen, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be much of a concern for me. That's the only reason why I bring it up. Like, I don't yeah. know if this is something to look at moving forward because two years ago, like when he played against Milwaukee, basically by himself being the only guy in Brooklyn. It's like mm -hmm. they had great defenders. They had like PJ Tucker was very physical with him. And he's still what the key is there, right? Is like he's got like half a foot on PJ Tucker. Last year they had that guys like Tatum who could check him with his height. Now mm -hmm. they have Aaron Gordon who can check him with his height. And if that's the common denominator between these between those two series, right, where he's being inefficient, that's clearly got to be throwing him off um mm -hmm. just his rhythm and his game as a whole. Um, 
because that's a good point, right? Like they got swept last year and he did not have a great showing in that, that series. Um, and again, we're seeing that inefficiency kind of come up here again, um, where you have another, you know, lengthy defender who can check him um, and just disrupt him as, as best you can. Like you're never going to prevent him. Like he's having a bad shooting night and he still put up almost 40 points. So you're yeah. never going to fully ice him out of a game. Um, but 38 from the field and 20% from three on a guy that was 50, 40, 90 in the regular season, like any head coach would take that 10 times out of 10 win or loss. Mm -hmm. Like you would say that somebody did their job in trying to stop him. Like you would want to limit the fouls as best you can, but um, from just a, a shooting perspective there in terms of field goals, like Aaron Gord has done a phenomenal job this series. 100%. So, yeah, it's just, it's, it's going to be interesting moving forward. Um, like you said, I don't know how sustainable this is, them combining for 80 points in order to get a win. But one thing I would say is fun to watch. <laughs> it's fun to watch Devin Booker go off. So or I'm if you're going to keep dropping 40, I'm here for it. I'm sitting there watching it, like, especially down the stretch with some of the tough shots D Book hit. I'm just like, like, what do you do? Like, it's ridiculous how, like, smooth his game looks in the mid-range, turnaround fadeaways, pull-ups, runners. Um, I know they'll have to make a, an adjustment going into the next game. It felt like he was able to walk into too many of his shots where that was coming up the floor and hitting a, you know, walking into three, coming off of a screen and just having way too much space to operate and just like kind of stepping into a nice mid range there or a float or a runner or whatever. Um, that's something Mike Malone will have to address. And I won't be surprised if we just saw an uptick in, in Bruce Brown's minutes because, um, you know, he's played good defense in, in games one and two of this series. Um, he's just a really physical, scrappy defender overall. Um, so I would not be shocked if they just give him the assignments like, bro, pick him up full court. Like, we got to do something to get him off of his rhythm um, because he's putting up ridiculous numbers right now. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, and even like late in the game, they tried to like double and trap him, which, you know, if him and KD are on the floor is probably your best option. Like, make TJ Warren, make Josh Okoge, make Tory Craig have to beat us campaign whoever it is um and you know kind of play that way so yeah I, we already touched on you know if the Suns are going to have a chance you're going to need three more performances like this from Katie and Book and I, I, that's just to give y'all a shot because again y'all can still lose these games y'all are very right, so that doesn't guarantee the win yeah, that does that doesn't guarantee the win you just have a chance to win if they combine for 70 plus every every single game so yeah yeah tough 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 for the Suns you know even with the win I said I I still wouldn't be super comfortable if I was a Suns fan um I still think the Nuggets probably get get game four and then head to Denver and look to close out this series um I don't know where Monty can really turn to other than you know they got Darius Baisley on the roster someone else that can just you know be you know, floor spacer, really athletic guy. Um, he played more more Terrence Ross, more Landry Shamit in this game, less Tory Craig, um, which helped a lot from, you know, getting those additional points, you know, from anybody else on the team. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that'll probably be the recipe, in, you know, moving forward. But He's trying. Monty's trying. Like, he's trying. But yeah. it's, just, it's tough with the way the roster is constructed. Yeah, no, like, again, like, there's only so much you can do when you traded away all your depth. Exactly. Yeah. As soon as I saw Terrence Ross in the game, I'm like, oh, yeah, Monty is – he's unloading the clip. He is trying any and everything right now. Everybody has touched the court in this series, I'm pretty sure, but Darius Baisley because Ish Wainwright was getting minutes earlier. <laughs> Biombo had minutes. You know, Damian Lee was getting some run. Um, so D. Bay is the only the person that – he's the only person who hasn't gotten any chance to provide any type of factor here in this series. So – at this point, like, it's not going to hurt. Like, throw him out there yeah. for a spurt. See what he can provide. Like, he might be a little spark plug for you there um, and just his hustle and athleticism because another reason why they were able to kind of get out to the lead that they were, especially at halftime, is how fast they, pay, they played in this game. And some of that is due to, to, you know, Chris Paul being out. You insert campaign, and he – if you watch, like, even when they're just inbound the ball for Nate, they're just pushing the ball up the court as fast as you can mm -hmm. and just trying to get to – Get the ball to Debo, get the ball to Katie in a good matchup and go. Like, do not let the Denver defense get set. They're not running any type of complicated plays, right? It's just a lot of very basic pick and roll or even see they'll get, like, Debo kind of a wing touch. 
and just clear out the whole opposite side so he has as much room to work with over there. So that, that helped him a lot. Um, I think, you know, Bays can come in and add to some of that, that hustle and pace there um, for Phoenix. But, yeah, Denver, uh, Denver looks scary. Denver looks really scary. They do. They really, really do. Yeah. Also, what's good with everybody getting hit in the balls? <laughs> bro, I don't know, bro. Like, I <laughs> – I like I don't know if that's just luck. I don't know if we really got some dirty players out here in the NBA or something, bro. But everybody just keeps getting hit in the nuts, bro. <laughs> the campaign uh, one, and they, 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 that wasn't even a foul because like clearly was not trying to do it. But it's a lot of people getting hit down under. <laughs> right, in, in postseason. I don't know, man. People playing dirty. People want that chip by any means. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crazy. Man. yeah. Because we had – Jokic got hit. He got hit twice in that game. The second time after the, the first one where he kind of got a quick tap down there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously the, the D book and LeBron one, he done gripped the whole man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, bro. I don't know what's going on in the NBA. Everybody's wilding right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um. Let's go on to the other game that happened last night. Um, the Celtics are, are able to take game three, get home court back in the series. They win 114-102 to 102 against Philly. Um, I don't know where James Harden went. He might need to put out a missing post. He need to go back to Vegas. <laughs> James Harden <laughs> need to go back to Vegas for the night, have a party a little bit, and then come back for game four because that is not the same player we've seen in game one. Uh <laughs> I saw people saying, like, you know, this is one of his – this might be his best playoff game and the best one we'll ever see from him. We're not going to see this out of him again. Um, and it's starting to look like they're right. Yeah. Um, shot is not – three for 14 is unacceptable. It is unacceptable from Harden. Um, again, he still had 11 assists. He's still facilitating at a high level, but you got to get – we need like, we need something from him. Like you can't, right? You're not gonna win this series. You don't get anything from James Harden and Maxi. It's tough. Like it's funny because Maxi is kind of uh, going on the radar radar as far as his performance, just because James Harden's performance was so bad. But mm -hmm. I mean, you got 30 from Joel with 13 boards. Like he seems like he's playing well. But you like we talked about it before against this Boston team that is so deep that can get scoring from plenty of different places. As long uh, uh along with the fact that Jaden Tatum and Jalen Brown can get it going at any moment. It's like you're going to need James Harden to step up, at least give you something. Like, obviously, you don't have to do the 45 that you did in game one, but Joel Embiid needs help. You need Maxi to to help you out, to bring you that scoring punch. So it's tough. Um, I don't know if it's the fact that uh, the length and the defense from the Celtics kind of picked up, it seems like. It seemed like um, from game one to game two, it was a focus on we're going to make James Harden uncomfortable. We're going to pressure mm -hmm. him more. We're going to pressure him earlier into the possessions. And – it, it seems like it's working right now. It definitely seems like it's working. So I don't know what the Sixers do. It's like Joel Embiid said it in, in the press conference. You just need guys to step up. That's just there's no like adjustment, like secret adjustment you need to make. You just need guys to step up. It's that simple. Yeah, and I, that's a, was like the second or third year in a row we've seen Embiid be like just blunt in the press conference and be like, look, at the end of the day, he's not wrong. Right? No, he's right. Like I respect the fact that he's able to just like in a public setting, just like, cause I'm sure he's doing it behind closed doors too. Like mm -hmm. holding people accountable. Like y'all have to play better. We have to play better as a team, but individually we need guys to continue to step up because any team that's going against the Sixers, like first and foremost, you're going to try to, to scheme to limit Joel as much as you can. You're never going to be able to stop him, but mm -hmm. they are packing the paint. They're throwing bodies at him. They're putting Grant Williams on him and just like trying to let him scrap as much as he can um, with Joel getting stepped on, bloody nose. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen somebody's head get stepped on. That was bro, a V move. Bro, he stomped on the man's skull. <laughs> like, bro, we got people getting hit in the nuts. We got people stepping on the head. Bro. If you don't like Draymond. that, you don't like NBA basketball. <laughs> <laughs> well, I blame Draymond, bro. I blame Draymond. Everybody's taking – Draymond started, bro. He's stomping on chest. He's he been kicking people in the nuts for years now. It's like, bro, what is happening, bro? People uh, watch too much Draymond, bro. He got too much influence on the league. Yeah. This is crazy right now. But uh Man, but yeah, that was the first. 
Yeah, I, I watched the replay back, and I was like, oh, my. Like, I had to turn away. I was like, oh, yeah. his head is just mm, on the and floor. That's a 300-pound seven-footer. Like, that's not a little guy, bro. Yeah, I'm surprised uh, his teeth was straight. I know his yeah. nose got messed up, but. But either way, right, he's scrapping. He's giving Embiid as much as he can give. Like I said, they're, they're trying to pack the paint against him. They're sending doubles. Like, that's always going to be the primary focus. And so you have to make teams pay for things like that. And you got to knock these shots down. Um, and like you said earlier, right, it seemed like there was a an adjustment to just step up that intensity going from game one to games two and three in the series. Um, even on the, like, off the opening tip, right, as soon as it landed in Harden's hand, like, Jalen Brown walked up. He's picking him up behind half court. He's picking him up by three quarters court. And he was doing that for most of the game, like picking him up 94 feet, like just getting in his chest before the ball even gets inbounded. Like someone else is bringing the ball up the court. We're not just going to let you get comfortable into the flow of this offense like you mm-hmm. did in game one because we saw what the outcome of that is. So, um, again, you got to tip your cap to the Celtics. And, and really this – the last two games as a whole, just outworking the, the, the Celtics. They just look like – or outworking the Sixers, I should say. They – they definitely seem like they just want it more. But the great players have to play like great players. Like Harden is already set in stone as being one of the greatest scorers we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, you should not be able to get put in check like this. It just can't yeah. happen. And we can't say that it's age. We can't say it's an injury, bro. You put up 45 two games, ago. Yeah. It's in you, right? You can do it. Um, so you're going to have to step up because – it's going to be hard for Embiid to have an absurd scoring night when so much attention and, and focus is going to be on him. Um, so, yeah, the series is going to come down to what can we get out of Harden, what can we get out of Maxi, Tobias, whoever these other shooters um, to be able to step up. But Celtics' ball movement has looked great. Their defenses look, you know, great in terms of just hustle and rotation. Honestly, I was watching a possession where, uh, you know, Jalen Brown is picking up. Harden, you know, full court. They're able to get the ball into him. He's making him work. He has to change directions multiple times just to get it past half court. They bring Paul Reed up to screen for him just to get him some space as soon as he gets across half court. And they went from Jalen Brown and then Marcus Swartz switch, switch onto him, right? And then it's like mm-hmm. every single possession, doesn't matter who's on the floor and it speaks to the Celtics' depth. Harden can get switched on to by JB, Malcolm Brogdon, Derek White, Marcus Smart, Tatum, it's like there is a elite defenders across everywhere. the board everywhere. And that's why like that's why the games that the Celtics blow like game one going back to the Hawks. It's so confusing because it's like at your best com- being completely unbiased at your best. You guys are the best team in the league. You guys are the deepest team in the league. You guys should be the best defensive team in the league. Mm-hmm. The most switchable team in the league. Which and, and it's crazy because all of those elite defenders still give you something offensively you all can shoot the ball all can score the basketball so it's like the games that they blow where um like game one that they should easily win at home it's so it's just weird and that's why we feel like well a lot of people feel like they just play down to their opponents sometimes like mm-hmm. they play better when their backs are against the wall that's how you know game two no doubt in my mind they were going to win that game even this game coming out i actually had a a, a feeling that the celtics were going to win I, I i picked them to win this game just because i like the games that they should win, sometimes they play down to their opponent. But the games that it's either even or their backs are against the wall, they play their best basketball. So, like, they, they just need to find a way to play at this level of intensity every single game and stop taking games off. Because you're right. When you do that, you're just wasting time. You're just blowing games. You're making the series go longer. So it's like you're not getting the same amount of rest. Like, if they can play at this level, honestly, there's no team in the NBA that should beat them. Yeah. No, like, they, I think, are clearly the – them and Denver are definitely the most deep teams. And I would say the Celtics are even deeper. Um, and again, like you said, like all, all of these elite defenders that you see can also hit threes and they're making impact plays on the offensive end on top of being, you know, the elite presence that they are on the defensive end. I have to mm-hmm. give a huge shout out to Malcolm Brogdon. He's been huge off the bench in this series as he's been for, you know, the Celtics the entirety of the season. Um, I think he had 15 last night, but, but 23 and 20, um, 23 in game two, 20 in game one. Um, so he's providing, you know, big points for them. Great shooting off the bench um, for the Celtics team. Yeah, they uh, 
they had Harden looking like Ben Simmons last night too. I even like I thought I was tripping the first time I saw it. Like, that's, a, that's a layup for Harden. What are we doing? Kicking right. out of that. Um, and the second time it happened, they booed him, and the announcers are like, "Did Harden just pass up a layup?" Like again, like they got I said, scared. They got him shook, made him uncomfortable, and it's just at that point now it's all in your head. At that point, once you once you're off, once you don't have the rhythm, once you're uncomfortable, it's all it it gets into your head. Right, and, and, but again, like I said, look. You're James Harden. There was a period in time where you were reaching that, or are we watching the greatest offensive player of all time? Like he was in that discussion when he was in Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, and people still have those debates from those, you know, those runs with that team. So <laughs> that can't happen. <laughs> that cannot yeah. happen under any circumstance. Like if they're going to, you know, have a chance to win this series, him and Embiid need to be the duo. It can't be Embiid and Co. Like exactly, they need, he needs to step up and get on that that level as well. Um, yeah, it's tough. They got to step yeah. up. And Maxie's Maxie's not. He doesn't get a pass too. Uh, Maxie, no, I feel him like Maxie shouldn't get a pass. I feel like Maxie also should, like I said, bring that scoring punch. Especially, it, it's it's interesting too because it's like the game one, no expectations. That you haven't no one beat. You feel like the focus should be on Harden. And that's when he goes off. But then when you have Embiid back, it's like, bro, Embiid's getting double teamed. The attention is on Embiid. I feel like you should thrive in a situation like that where, like a Devin Booker, for instance, like mm-hmm. KD goes there, KD gets a lot of the attention. It's like, I'm not seeing the double teams. I'm not getting the defensive focus. It's like, I'm going to yeah. go off. Like, it's just interesting how, like, it seems like Embiid, like Harden, he loved game one when he was th- that guy, it felt like. So, I don't know. It's it's, it's just interesting. What he say in his his presser last year? He's like the ball never found me, right? And after yeah, it was uh, something like that, right? Like, bro, you're James Harden. You have the ball, right? You have the, the ball, ball, bro. <laughs> like, I promise you, the ball can find you if it if you wanted to find it. Exactly. So, but yeah, to your point, right? Like <laughs> with the added pressure that Embiid puts on the defense, you should be thriving in that additional space. And mm-hmm. even with Maxi, like some of that, he's just coming up the court super quick and, and pulling threes that I don't love. They're not terrible shots, but um, he's just not in his rhythm. Um, shots weren't falling for him, but, you know, for them to to pull out this series, or they're, they're going to have to drop or else this one may be over quicker than we thought it would be. All right. Agreed. Going over to, to your Lakers, right? Drop game two. Um, so they, they get the split, which is really all you can ask for going into the defending champs, you know, home floor. Um, but – a blowout loss, 27-point loss, um, was pretty much done by the third quarter. Um, they were down a ton at, at halftime, and it got worse in the third. And so I think Darvin benched all the starters really going into the fourth quarter for the most part. Um, and, you know, really a tough game. Um, Clay had a, a phenomenal performance, 8 for 11 from three. You know, he had it going from the, the get-go. His release, there were some of the shots that he took. Like, he is moving and catching the ball in form. Like, he's not catching and dipping. Like, as he's catching the ball, he's already initiating his shooting motion. He's barely touching it. Yeah. Unreal. I was watching it back in slow motion. I like, that has to be the fastest release in NBA history. Like, there's. It's up there. It's definitely up there. I, I, even with Steph, like, as fast as he, like, his shot seems effortless. And I think that's why he's able to make some of the more ridiculous shots that he is able to make. But Clay, I think, has one of the prettiest jumpers of all time. Like, just the form is like, 100%. It's beautiful. I think um, Clay's form and Clay's jump shot is looks prettier than Steph's jump shot. 100%. Like it's, it's, be- bro, it's just beautiful to watch. Um, and it, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So, as always, I'm always going to give you first dibs, especially with <clears> these <throat> Laker games. So, what did you see from this game that was different from game one um, that, that the Warriors were able to exploit and get out to the, this huge win? Anthony Davis sucks. <laughs> yeah, that was the, <laughs> I, He played bad. I mean, that was the real – now, th- there actually was some um some adjustments I've seen that Steph, mm-hmm. uh, Steve Kerr made, um putting Steph Curry on the ball more rather yeah. than making him be off ball. Like, you saw Steph Curry bring the ball up a lot. Um, It seemed like he played – an actual traditional point guard role this game. You could see, like, I believe he had what, seven assists in, like, the first quarter, yep. something like that, ended up with, like, 12. So you've seen they made an effort to put the ball in his hands in the beginning of possessions 
rather than running him off screens. And um, it, it worked. I mean, it worked. He, he, he drew a lot of our attention, obviously, it's Stephen Curry. So um, putting the ball in his hands, making him be a distributor, that definitely – it definitely helped the Warriors a little bit. They went small ball, um, so we couldn't really just pack the paint like how we did in the first game. Because when they started with Draymond and Looney, it's like we don't have to play either of those guys. We, as you've seen in the first game, we had LeBron sitting in the paint. We had Anthony Davis sitting in the paint. And we can't do that with Jermichael Green in the game. We have to have somebody mm-hmm. guard him. He's he's actually hitting big shots. Like He's playing pretty well. Like for a guy that's barely played most of the season, most of the playoffs, he, he's stepping up. But, um, 15 have points some... in 13 minutes. Room. that's huge that's huge ultimate that's unaccounted for points that it's mm-hmm. just it is what it is so we can't sag off him and then once you have Draymond at the five making him the person that sets the screen that brings Anthony Davis out of the paint so now he has to step up so now it's different but the the whole defense of, of scheme it's 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 not going to work so that's a little bit different um but I will say if they're going to go small if they're going to put Draymond at the five Anthony Davis needs to take advantage of that on the offensive end. I understand defensively it's not going to be the same. He's not going to have the same impact the way they play in the small ball. That's fine. Mm-hmm. But you have to punish that. If they're going to go small, there is no reason you shouldn't destroy everyone on the court on the offensive end of the floor. I understand Draymond's a great, defend- a great defender, but Draymond is also 6'6", 6'7", at best. Anthony Davis should destroy him. So it's like Yes, that change will help the Warriors on the offensive end, but it also should help us on the offensive end. So that's why this whole series is just going to come down to Anthony Davis, whether he's engaged, whether he's making his shots, whether he's being aggressive, getting to the basket. I don't – if Draymond is guarding him, I don't need to see you hitting those those middies. I don't need to see you shooting turnaround jumpers. I need you on the block, being a big man, attacking the basket, going up aggressive. So that's really the, the biggest change, but – Honestly, I've I've watched the Lakers all year, man. I know when Anthony Davis is gonna have his stinkers, but I I literally call you. You could agree. I called it. I checked, yeah. I checked the, the group chat when I saw Kavon Looney was sick, was only gonna play twenty minutes. I said Anthony Davis is still gonna play bad. This is the this is the perfect time after a thirty and twenty game. Kavon Looney is barely gonna play. They're starting Draymond on you. I'm like, I know Anthony Davis is gonna have a generational stinker, and he's gonna play <laughs> terribly. And that's exactly what's going to happen. But the same way I predicted that, I do predict Anthony Davis will absolutely feast in game three. I Listen, I might, I might bet some money on it. I guarantee you Anthony Davis will go off. I know we're going to win, and I know Anthony Davis will have a good game. So, so guarantee like said, the dub right now. 1,000% we're winning this game. There's no shot we're losing this game. I think we're winning next two. I think it's going to go the same way it went with Memphis. Are we going to win game one? We're gonna lose game two. We're gonna win two at home. We're gonna lose game five, and then we're gonna win game six. That's how. That's how I'm predicting it. I gotta see how the the two games at home go, but mm-hmm. we're definitely winning game three. We're not losing at home. I'm not. That's not happening. But yeah, Anthony Davis. He's just. It's, it's gonna come down to him. Um, he's just gonna have to be aggressive. Like I said, he's just gonna have to punish that small ball lineup because, like I said, it helps them offensively, but it also should help us on the offensive end. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at. AD's point totals game by game this playoffs. 22, 13, 31, 12, 31, 16, 30, and then 11. I will say real quick, too. I will say, and it's funny when you watch the games, you can tell his best offensive games are also his best defensive games because when he has mm-hmm. it going offensively, that translates into his defense, his hustle, his just drive in general. Like the game, the last game when we closed out the Grizzlies, Anthony Davis was engaged. He was diving for loose balls. We're up 20. He's over here diving for loose balls because he has it going. He's in that rhythm. He's in that aggressive mindset. So that's the main thing. He has to get it going offensively because that also translates into other aspects of his game. Yeah, no, for sure. He, It definitely feels like that his motor is attached to just how dominant he's able to be on both sides of the ball. Like the defense is never bad, but right. it feels like it kicks into another gear if the offense is going that way. 100%. Um, I want to ask you this because this is something that they talked about um, <clears throat> on you know, inside the NBA with, with Kenny and Shaq and them is, you know, Chuck, Chuck and Shaq always get on AD because, you know, they see the potential in him to be in the conversation for one of the best players in the world. Um. And, and Kenny said something that really made me think is, you know, coming out of Kentucky, right? Like what made him so, you know, highly coveted and to become the number one pick that he was, was not the fact that he was, you know, 
crazy on offense. Like, obviously, the skill set was there, and his like he just was more dynamic as a big. But his defense has always been like where he thrived, especially. Um, and like we said, that <laughs> it feels like it never wavers as much on a night to night basis. Like he's always going to be a defensive presence. Um, and so something that he said that I just wanted to ask you was like, do we, are we just expecting too much from him on the offensive end? Like knowing that that's never really been like his game. Like he's never been an offensive first, offensive minded player. So, I, I see what he's trying to say, um, that he's a defensive first. That's basically what he's saying. He's a defense first, offense second. And if his defense is going – or, like, if his offense is going, that's just, like, an added bonus. Right. But when you're so talented, though, I just feel like – I don't know. I don't really – I don't like that because, you, bro, you're clearly the best big man on the floor. 90% of games you're going to play. Mm-hmm. You're going to be against small, people that's small than you, like the Draymond thing. It's like – Bro, you just I, you just gotta be aggressive. Like I understand if your shots not falling, cool. Like I'm not I'm not mad at you if your shots not falling, but it's the fact that you're not being aggressive on the offensive end. I at least need you to go out there and look like you want to play. Like his games that he plays bad, it looks like 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 DeAndre Ayton, like we were talking about earlier. Like he just going through the motions. Like that's my biggest problem. Is like if you were aggressive every single night and sometimes you had some bad games because you're a defensive first person, then it wouldn't be as bad. But it's the fact that you go out there and look like, like it is what it is. Like I'm just going through the motions. Like it's fine. Like I'm not going to be aggressive. I'm not going to attack this six, six defender that's on me right now. So that's my biggest problem. Um, he, he just, if he was aggressive all the time, I would, I would get what Kenny is saying, but I just need to see that motor from him all the time. Yeah, I agree. Right. Like I see what he's saying, but, it's the fact that you he's done it and the times where he did it pretty consistently with the Pelicans, right? Like he's going into these playoff series, he's putting up 40 plus a night. Right, you've um, done it before. Yeah. You've right. Like that, done it the, the runs that he's had in playoff series, even against the Warriors in the past, right? Like losing efforts nonetheless, but like giving them 30 plus, 40 plus points going against the Blazers, giving them 47. And I remember what game was game three, maybe that series. When, I think it was when Boogie was there. Um, mm-hmm. putting up 47 on Portland. Like, the issue is not that he can't do it. It's the consistency that's always been the problem because we mm-hmm. know it's there and you you pull it out. Like I said, every other game in this playoff run has been a really dominant offensive performance followed up by something more quiet. Mm-hmm. The further we get into these playoffs, like we're going against the defending champs right now, those – Games cannot happen. And again, we said some of it is scheme. Obviously, like I think Draymond guarded him 19 or 20 times in game one that basically doubled into game two. Um, but like you said, right, as great of a defender as Draymond Green is, like he's gonna be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Bro, you got like half a foot on him. There's nobody in this league that can really check you like that. No, not at all. Because even the even the big men that are bigger than you, you are your foot speed is way faster than them. You're right. more agile than them. That's You're why just, Looney like, can't guard him. Exactly. Like he's just and he's so skilled offensively. That's what that's the problem. It's like then going back to his inconsistency. That's why it's just tough. You can never really consider him a consistent top three to five NBA player in in the league. Just because it's like I mean at his best, yeah, for, he looks like the best player in the league at his best. Like game one, he looked like the best player in the league. Because he's affecting the game mm-hmm. offensively and defensively, but it's like those top five to seven best players in the league, you can pencil them in for at least their average every single night. Like AD's bad games are like eleven. Like what do you have this game? He had eleven points. Exactly, exactly eleven points, seven rebounds. Like Giannis, people are killing Giannis for that elimination game. He had thirty and like fifteen. Like that was his bad game. LeBron yeah. his prime. His bad games were 27, 8, and 8. Like, those are his bad games. Anthony Davis's bad games are this one, 11 and 7. So, so it's just tough because you know the talent-wise, he is up there with anybody in the league as far as just pure talent. But it's just the inconsistency is the problem with him. But um, it's tough. Definitely, definitely tough. Yeah, and it's it, it feels a little bit worse even knowing that, you know, in this game, this was probably the – the best LeBron may have looked this entire postseason, like at least to start the game, right? Like from the get-go, the shot has fallen. He looked 
you know, like I had a little bit more spring in his step than he normally did. Agreed. Um, and, you know, he had, you know, shooting the ball much better, ended up going three for eight this game. Um, everything seemed to be falling, especially early, like deep middies, um, threes, fall away jumpers. Um, and so, like, it feels like you kind of squandered the first good LeBron game um, mm -hmm. of this series here. And, or, you know, from a shooting perspective, really. And, like you said, that inconsistency from AD is, is it hurts so much, again, because, like, you don't want to drop games to this team because of how dangerous they are. Like, even if you go up 3-1, right, like you win these next to a home, you go up 3-1, like – you were never going to count out a Steph Curry team, even if it's like they're down 10 with four minutes left because you could blink. Y'all could be losing real quick, four possessions, right. four quick threes. So, um, you know, that team with as much, you know, veteran championship experiences they had, they have, is not going to go out easy regardless of whatever happens here, you know, in these two games in LA. So, um, yeah, you don't want to squander those opportunities. And on top of that, I don't know if AD cares about it or not, but, if he finished out this playoff run, right, like let's say the Lakers were able to go through the series, get to the finals, win the finals, and he's able to string together, you know, nine or ten more performances like he had um, in game one of the series where it's like he's clearly the best player on the floor. He's given you like 30 and 15, 30 and 20, 35 and 10, whatever it is. Those discussions of him entering that top tier of player are going to come back, like without a doubt, like, the playoffs get weighed so heavily and like, you know, if I'm a player, I might not care that much, but um, like just his perception in, you know, by like the media, NBA, Twitter, whatever, just fans in general is going to like flip on his head entirely um, because we're able to see that consistency. Cause again, we know the dominance is there, but if you're able to string together a lot of these games and you couple that with winning a championship against the, it would be a relatively tough road. Like you go through a scrappy Memphis team, you have to take out the defending champs. We would it's have like to you, beat the one, two, and three seed in the West. Right. And then beat whoever comes out of the East, which is, you know, Boston. Oh, sorry, sorry. Kings was the Kings was the three seed. My bad. Sorry about that. That's true. Um, either way, it's going to be a tough road because, you know, whoever comes out of, you know, Denver, Phoenix, if you're able to get out of this series, like mm -hmm. tough matchup, like either way. Um, so, you're able to put all that together. Like that's a legacy type of run. Um, and again, I'm not huge on like massive swings and a postseason or trying to think that players care that much about how they're viewed in the media, but um, those conversations would, would start back up. And I'd say probably deservedly. So, right. Like what we saw from him in game one of the series, if he's able to pull that together a couple more times. How can you not say that he's, a top five player in the league or, or in that, you know, in that realm of, of players. I'll do you one even better. Anthony Davis goes on a great playoff run. We win the championship. If we win the championship, he will get finals MVP because he is our, our right now. Anthony Davis is our best player. It's obvious that when he has his good games, we, we win the game. Like, mm -hmm. like you said, LeBron just had his best shooting game of the whole postseason. Yep. One of his best games of the whole postseason. And it meant nothing. We got blown out. Lord. So his impact right now, is way bigger than LeBron's impact. So if he goes in this finals run, we win the championship. He wins finals MVP. That is a finals MVP, two championships. Forget even right now, top five play all time, even as far as like big men, as mm -hmm. far as like Lakers big men, there's been some great Lakers big men in the in the history of the NBA. So he will cement himself as one of those great Laker big. So it's like, even if he doesn't care about right now, top five player in the league, I feel like he should care about his legacy as far as, like, being remembered as one of the, the best big men to put on a Lakers uniform. So, yeah, I, I feel like that's something he should care about. Yeah, two chips and a finals MVP would put him in, you know, that select conversation with guys like Kareem and Shaq, like, in terms of mm -hmm. what they were able to produce as their time as a, as a Laker. Exactly. Uh, and you're going to win a finals with LeBron. LeBron's – everyone remembers the LeBron final. So, it's like – to be the guy, because I already know how the media is going to be. It's uh, The narrative is going to be he carried LeBron to the finals. Regardless of whether that's true or not, regardless of whether that's fair or not, yeah. that still looks good on you. Yeah. Like, anyway, yeah. like, so, uh, listen, I would, if I was him, I definitely would care about that. Mm -hmm. Going back to the uh, the Warriors side of things for a little bit, 
Um, like you mentioned, Jermichael Green gets a start in this game because you know Looney had some some illness. Um, but regardless of that, it seemed like the, a good strategic play um, to again go small, put Draymond down at the five. Um, it eliminates one non-shooter from the floor, um, so they're really almost running, you know, basically back to going that small ball five out type of lineup um, where Draymond is going to be the primary screen setter there. Um, you're able to keep shooters in the perimeter at all times. Um, it felt like that, I think, obviously lessened AD's impact on the defensive end because they're not looking to, to get downhill as much. Um, and, and they're still trying to sit him in the drop and he's kind of trying to navigate, you know, how much he can be in the paint versus, oh crap, here comes Steph coming off of a DHL. I have to try to, to get up on this. So um, there'll have to be some adjustment there from him and, and Darvin Ham and how they're going to play that moving forward. Um, because again, you can't let Clay or Steph get hot like this in, in games because it's going to be tough to win. Um, just with like the avalanche of points that will follow if that happens. Um, and, and to your point, right, some of that adjustment is just going to have to be like, going to have to take advantage of it on the other end of the floor and force Steve Kerr's hand to be like, all right, we're going to have to do something. We can't just let you feast on that side of the ball. Um, so I think, you know, that was huge. I also feel like, um, you know, they definitely, like you mentioned earlier, put a, a, a concerted effort to make sure that Steph was on the ball a lot more tonight. Um and it felt like going from game one uh, of the series to game two, you know, Vanderbilt was obviously took a Steph assignment in both games. In game one, it felt like he was much more physical with him. Um, he was doing his best to deny him the ball off of the inbound. Um, in this game, he kind of you – know, even just like – I think it was Tim Lego was doing a breakdown and showing comparisons mm -hmm. of him side by side. And it's like he's giving him more cushion to start, not like forcing him to change directions to get up the court. It's just so much easier to get in your rhythm as a shooter like that. Um, and so that's something that, you know, if I'm done for him, I see that on film. Like, we know it's a tough assignment. You know, Vanderbilt's only going to be playing, you know, 25-ish minutes a game. In those 25 minutes, you need to do, like, it has to be max effort. Like, as tiring as it's going to be, you can't take any possessions off because you take a possession off, that's three points. You take four right. possessions off, that might be 12 points. 12 mm -hmm. points will lose you a game. So it has to be a, a fully locked in effort from start to finish for them. Um, Austin Reeves at times to me at times to me looked um, rough on the defensive end, which is you know to be expected. That's not necessarily a strong suit. Um, so I wouldn't be shocked if we maybe get <clears throat> more Schroeder minutes in that spot potentially, um, just because he you know is a better defender can can uh, impact the game is can be a pest at times, especially. Um, you know, in passing lanes and just trying not to hound a ball handler and get a couple of steals. Um, so that wouldn't shock me there either. So like we mentioned earlier, it's going to be a huge chess match in the series between, you know, Steve Kerr and Darvin Ham, just with the clashing styles between these two teams. So I'm excited to see what both teams pull out here in game three, how the Lakers can respond to this small ball lineup. Um, I'm sure Kerr will continue to go with it. I think it, the spacing looked great. Their ball movement looked great. Um, Steph looked more like a, a traditional point guard or being mm -hmm. in that playmaking facilitating role um, and still gave you 20 on 12 shots. So that's scary. Like, like it's going to be going to be interesting. You know, like you said, you think they're going to get the next two at home. It's going to be tough. It's definitely not going to, I'm going to be without a fight. Um, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy, but yeah, I mean, the only adjustment that I feel like, not even adjustment, I should say, like we talked about this whole time, Anthony Davis just has to force them out of the small ball lineup. That's mm -hmm. that's my biggest thing. I agree with the with Vando. She should be a more aggressive in pressuring the ball a little bit more. But this whole series, even we knew this beforehand, we knew this after game one, we know this after game two. I feel like this whole series, if the Lakers are going to win this series, it comes down to Anthony Davis being the best player on, on the court, or at mm -hmm. least matching step as far as the best player. But you should be aggressive every single night. You should be we should be looking to get him the ball every single night and force them out of that small ball lineup. It's like you said, there's no way they're going to keep running the small ball lineup if we are if he is killing them on the offensive end of the court. So it's going it's definitely going to be interesting. I'm this is it's funny because this is a is a very interesting series as far as Darvin Ham is he able to keep up as far as coaching with Steve mm -hmm. Kerr as far as making adjustments. So I, I'm actually very curious to see how this game three and game four goes because we knew after game one, we knew Steve Kerr is going to do something. We didn't know what it was, but he, yeah. he's going to do something, make some sort of adjustment because he's not just going to 
let Anthony Davis and LeBron sit in the paint all day. We knew he was going to do something. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious to see how Darvin Ham responds. So that's that's something I'm going to be looking for moving forward. For sure, yeah. I think um, this is a big opportunity for him to, you know, cement himself as a really good playoff coach, right? Because that's mm-hmm. always what separates. Like you have coaches that are you know good motivators, good developers, whatever it is, but the best coaches, and especially in the playoffs, are X's and O's guys and guys that can adjust their schemes on the fly. That's why Ty Lue mm-hmm. has gotten so much credit over the past few years because – you know, missing Kawhi or missing PG or missing both, um, he's able to get his teams in a position to be tight in games or win games just because of how he's able to um, to scheme guys, how he's able to to put guys in positions to be successful um, even when they're shorthanded. So, um, you know, like you said, this is going to be a big opportunity for him, not even just in game three, but just moving forward as this chess match continues to go because they're able to get – you know, game three in this series, Steve Kerr is going to change something else up, right? Like, exactly. It's going to be a constant back and forth. It's never going to be the same type of matchup. Um, you know, like, you'll see more GP2. Maybe we'll see more Moses Moody. We might see less Jordan Poole. We may get back to seeing more Jordan Poole later in the series. Like, it's always going to be, you know, switching around and shuffling of the pieces to find what works best on any given night. So, I need to see definitely... in-game adjustments, too. Not just not just before the game. I need to see, because Steve Kerr might change something mid-game, like how yep. they ran the zone in game mm-hmm. one kind of got him back into the game a little bit on the 14-0 run. So I need to see, like, in-game adjustments. If Steve Kerr, Steve Kerr does this, I need to see you match it with something else. So that's that's going to be something I'm looking forward to as well. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and, and honestly, like, going back to it really quickly, like, I think Moses Moody has played really good minutes for them. Um, mm-hmm. I you know he got a lot of minutes in this game. Some of it was in garbage time. But even before that, I just – he's looked very impactful, not just from a shooting perspective. Like, he's made a couple of good shots for them in, in both games here. But um, – you know, I think he had seven rebounds in this game. Like, just his hustle um, on both sides of the ball has been huge for this team. I would not be surprised if between him, DiVincenzo, and GP2, we just see them really eat into Jordan Poole's minutes because, again, like last series, Jordan Poole has been a tough watch, especially on the defensive end, has a lot of just dumb foul. He had 5,016 minutes in this game, which is, as a guard, is crazy. Um, and a lot of them are just – He's out of position and scrambling and doing too much and getting fouled. So, um, you know, Steve Kerr, I would not be surprised if he pulls that trigger real quick um, and, and looks to get Jordan Poole's minutes cut down some and, and get more impactful guys in the series. Yeah, 100%. I agree. It is, it's funny, too. It's interesting how um, it seems like Jonathan Kaminga is just completely out of the rotation. A lot of those young guys are just completely out of the rotation. It's interesting how, like, even like with your Michael Green starting, it seems like Steve Kerr is like, no, we're gonna trust in our veterans. We're not gonna mm-hmm. try to merge between the old guys and the young guys. So uh, that was pretty interesting. It's, I'm curious to see how that impacts Kaminga's like development, and he's still gonna stay engaged because there could be series. Say they win this series, there could be a series moving forward where they're gonna need him to step up. Mm-hmm. They need him to play more minutes. So I'm curious to see if that impacts him in in, in one way. Yeah, in his presser, he said that is he said it's hard. Like right, like you want to be out there making an impact and you're not getting a ton of minutes a night and you got 10 minutes in this game and it was basically just garbage time. Right. So um, I even think in this series, right. Like having another lengthy defender who is athletic, you know, um, and and can space the floor. Somebody like he's not like somebody that, you know, you'll leave open, but he can hit the shot. Um, That's a piece that you may want to put in at some point in this series. And so like, you've got to be ready when that number is called and, um, you know, I'm sure guys like Draymond and Iggy are staying in his ear because they know the importance of just being there when your number is called. As many times as they've gone on these championship runs, there's always been a couple of guys who get spot minutes in different series but have made huge, huge impacts going all the way back to those original series. Guys like Brandon Rush and Leandro Barbosa, you know, having huge minutes, mm-hmm. Sean Livingston. Um, and, like, that's the type of role that – Guys like, you know, Kaminga, GP2, DiVincenzo, and Moody can fill, you know, going into this, you know, postseason. So, yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting. He's got to keep got to keep his focus about him because his number could be called at any moment. He, we saw even in, you know, last year in the playoffs, like he could be a real impact player, even being as, as young as he is. So, um, 100%. You know, that, that'll definitely be interesting to see, you know, going forward in this series and, and if they're able to advance moving forward this postseason as a whole. All right. 100%. Yeah. Anything else you got on, on this series? I know they got game, game three here tonight. 
at the late game. I think it's eight thirty, seven thirty, something like that here at Central. Yeah. Um, I feel like we need to win this game. <laughs> I feel like it's not a must win, but it's basically a must win. Like I, feel, I feel like we need to win this game. So I expect them to come out. I expect them to play well. Like I said, I expect Anthony Davis to play well. So I, I, I have full, I have confidence we're gonna win this game. You heard it here first. You just said Lakers in six. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying Lakers in six, man. Um, first game of the day today. Haven't played since the last time we recorded. Um, again, Knicks Heat. Um, they are going first game in Miami. Um, Jimmy Butler is still questionable. Kind of was interested to see as we're getting closer to tip time if we get an official um, announcement on whether he'd be playing or not. I'm going to double check, but I haven't seen anything yet. Uh, yeah, I still see that he's questionable. Um, I kind of have a feeling that he's going to play just based on how he was reacting on the sideline yeah. there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, game two. Um, I saw. I, here's a report from yesterday that said barring a setback is pretty. Op they're pretty optimistic that he's going to be playing. Um, as we mentioned, right? Like you know, no Jimmy, no hero. That game was way too close for comfort for the Knicks. Um, so, if Jimmy is playing, I think that he should be able to take this one um, and look to definitely put some pressure here going into Game Four and go up three one um, on the Knicks in this series. But um, now, again, a lot of that is going to be dependent on his health um, and going to have to see big performances out of both Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson. And then also, again, you need others to step up, even outside of R.J. Barrett at this point. Like, we need to see better performances out of Emmanuel quickly. You know, Obi Toppin has been, you know, had good spot minutes here and there. Um, any good performances you can get out of those other guys from a scoring perspective um, and then, you know, rebounding and hustle from guys like Isaiah Hartenstein is going to be huge. Um for for the Knicks here on the road, yeah, one hundred percent. It's 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 funny because we talked about how the key where they're gonna get that scoring from. Once Tyler Hero went out, where they're mm -hmm. gonna get that that scoring from? Where we're gonna where they're gonna get guys to step up from? But they they have guys that stepped up. They have having guys that are playing well. So the Knicks are gonna have to do a good job of having their others, like you said, Emmanuel quickly, just just someone to step up and give them something else other than R.J. Bear, other than Julius Randle, other than Jalen Brunson. So mm -hmm. um, I hope Jimmy is 100 percent. I really hope, hope he comes back and he looks like playoff Jimmy again because it's going to be more entertaining for us. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how the, how the Knicks respond if Jimmy is playing and he's close to 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. So that game tips here shortly. Jimmy's still a game time decision. So we'll see. You got any. Who do you think is going to win this game? I got I got Miami if Jimmy's playing. If Jimmy's not yeah. playing, I'd probably give it 65-35 Miami still. If Jimmy is playing, I think Jimmy – I think the Heat win. If he's not, I think it's a legitimate 50-50 toss-up. Like, because, like I said, Jimmy wasn't playing last game and the Knicks still barely won. Mm -hmm. And that was in Madison Square Garden. So, it's like going back to Miami, I mean – you can you can never count out the heat. You can never count out Eric Spolster. Yeah. You can never count out the heat. So if Jimmy's not playing, I think it's a legitimate 50-50 anyone can win that game. But if he's playing, uh, I think Jimmy will pull through. For sure. So yeah, just covered all the games, got all the matchups set up here. Um, what else you got? What else you want to talk about? Man, I, honestly, I don't even know. I don't even have I don't really have much to say. I really don't have much to say. I don't know. Um, Lakers and four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nah, man. Um, no, nah, this this play. It's been a real good playoff so far. It's been a really good playoff. Um, I just hope everyone stays healthy. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to see. Matter of fact, I do have a question. I do have a question for you. I know you don't really get, you don't really get into the whole uh like legacy media <laughs> who's top. There. I know that's not you, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pressure you like that, but. Who do you feel like has the most to gain from winning a championship this year? Like, what one player you feel like has the most to gain to out of winning a championship? It's some real interesting because you could like, bro. There's so many different ways you can go. You can go like Bron, he wins. That's five. That's you know, the goat conversation for people who do, who don't have him as the goat. Or you can say someone like, I don't know, Jason Tatum getting his first ring. Like, bro, there's so many different ways you can go with it. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm real curious to see what your answer on this. I would say, um, 
There's a couple of different ways you can definitely take it, right? Because <clears throat> apparently if Steph Curry get another ring, he is a <laughs> GOAT player. He's the greatest ever, according not, to me. Not LeBron off of Mount Rushmore. That was, <laughs> that, bro, that was an insane topic. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but realistically, when I think about it, right, like there's been some nasty narratives around Jokic, right? Like you're, you're a two-time MVP, but what do you have to show for it in the playoffs? If he mm-hmm. won a chip this year, that shut a lot of that, that extra talk up. Um, it probably really validate him, which it shouldn't even need to happen because, right, like you don't, you don't love his play style or whatever. Like he's not the most flashiest player. He doesn't get on social. He doesn't do a lot of talking. But at the end of the day, like he really takes over games in a variety of ways, even in just the series alone. Like we've seen him put up 40 and from a scoring perspective almost only have five assists. And last night he had a 30-point triple-double. In the first game he had like 15 assists. So like he – fills that gap of whatever is needed from him on a night-to-night basis Um, at the same time, like being unstoppable to, to stop apparently on offense Mm -hmm. with, with, you know, from all three levels of the court. Um, So I think that would be huge for him. Same thing really kind of case for Joel in that, you know, argument of like, you've been one of the best bigs in the league for some years now, MVP this season could get us, you know, a, f- a championship this year and a, probably a finals MVP if they were able to pull that one off, like that would, you know, really start to cement your legacy, right, in, in that case. So I think really either of those two guys would would go a long way at kind of shifting how their narrative is portrayed as like, you know, they're great. They're great in the regular season. They can do all this. That Now both of them have hardware to back it up, um, but one of them is able to get, you know, something out of the postseason, you know, either one of them winning a championship would likely be their finals MVP too. So you get the chip, mm-hmm. you get the MVP. Um, so I think really either two of them probably have the the most to gain outside of Steph. Yeah, I, I was about to say, honestly, the the easiest answer is to say Steph just because of the way the media portrays him. It's mm-hmm. like they already are calling him the greatest point guard ever, which, I mean, that that's a legitimate debate. Like, I feel like that's a legit debate. I think kid. he is. Yeah, I've, I've thought about it, and, like, at the end of the day, like, I'm not saying he's the best passer of all time, he's not the best playmaker of all time, but, like, he starts every night at the one, <laughs> like every right, other yeah, point yeah, guard yeah. does. His position is point guard. Right, and he's the greatest shooter of all time. That shouldn't even be debated, right? He's broken records. He single-handedly changed the way that teams play basketball. He single-handedly changes the way – that teams defend. He changed the way that eight-year-olds play basketball, changed the way people go play pickup, right? Like he has changed <laughs> the game from so many different levels. Um, has the MVPs, has the, the the postseason accolades. He did it before KD. He did it after KD. I don't want to hear that argument either. Like he's got the finals MVP too now. So to me, he's the, the best point guard ever. Like just from somebody that started at the position, I would take multiple other guys in front of him as better passers. I take LeBron as a better passer, you know, MJ, mm-hmm. whatever, Jason Kidd, guys like that. But solely just like guys who started at the one, Steph has got to be number one. At least in my eyes, he's got to be number one. And I'm not going to take it as crazy if somebody said otherwise, because again, at the end of the day, if you value some of those other aspects more, or if you want to view being a traditional point guard as somebody who does play make in that way um, and runs an offense in that type of fashion, then cool. That's your prerogative. But for me, I would have to say Steph is the best to ever do it. And I'm not going to, like, like I said, it's a legitimate debate. I'm not mm-hmm. going to disagree with anyone that has magic. I'm not going to disagree with anybody that has Steph. I mean, they're two completely different players, All right? Two completely different players. They play the position two completely different ways. Um, I, The one thing I will say, I think personally, I still have magic. Um, Like, Going back, I'm I don't know, I'm I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to like basketball history. Like I've gone back, I've done a lot of research as far as like because I'm curious, like you hear all the time about they say, Oh yeah, Magic did this, Larry did this. Like I actually wanted to see for myself like what they actually did. So going back and like just looking at some of Magic's games, some of his playoffs performances, just like his impact he had on the league, even like when he first came in as a rookie with no Kareem carrying that team to the finals, winning finals MVP, playing center. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a ridiculous, like, accomplishment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I think I personally still have magic just because 
Also, I don't think people realize Steph Curry, he kind of, he started his prime kind of late, if you really think about it. Like, he doesn't really have the same as far as NBAs and all that stuff as some of the other greats and, like, that top 10 players of all time. So I think that's a little bit interesting. I think he will end his career as the best point guard ever. I 100% agree with that. But I think that's, like, for right now, I probably would have Magic a, a little bit ahead of him. So, um. Yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting debate. It's definitely an interesting debate. I, I thought it was crazy how a lot of people don't think it's even close, though. Like, a lot of people that I've seen, because, you know, this topic came up recently, especially yeah. after that Game 7 performance, a lot of people think that it's, like, it's not even close. Like, he's way better than Magic. He's way ahead of Magic. And I think yeah. that's where we get a little bit of ahead of ourselves. Right. It's like, now we're kind of disrespecting what Magic Magic Johnson has done and accomplished in this league. Because it's not only his play. You were talking about how Steph has changed the game. Magic Johnson literally saved the game. Like he literally saved the <laughs> NBA. NBA was think... on tape delay for he pulled up. Exactly. So it's like, I don't, I think. Hey, man, people... Larry, let me not discredit Larry. Right, right. <laughs> but I think a lot of people are underrating Magic Johnson's influence and his his importance to the NBA. So I that part, I just thought was interesting how some people think it's not even close. It's not even a debate. Yeah, I, I'll never have issues with people having debates. Like, I'm not I'm not one to, like, really be big on ranking players, like, one through mm. ten. Like, you got people in the right echelon of tier. Like, that's always going to be cool with me. Mm. Um, but stuff like that, where it's like, it's not even close. It's like, all right, we're doing a little bit too much. Now. We're not going to discredit the fact that Magic Johnson is undoubtedly one of the greatest players ever to play the game of basketball and had his uh, career cut short. Right. <laughs> like, uh Arguably the greatest offensive engine ever. Like, exactly. Arguably. So yeah. yeah, that's a good question. What do you think? Who do you think has the, the most to gain out of this playoff run? Um man. I I said I said Steph is the easiest answer, but I'm I'm trying to be a little bit different um when I look at this. Because obviously the easiest answer is like Steph, LeBron. Honestly, you a little side note, I don't think LeBron has even out of the players left in the NBA or in, in the playoffs, I don't even think he's top five just because I feel like as of right now, it's either you think he's the GOAT or you think he's the second greatest player of all time. I don't think people who like who are like diehard MJ fans with this title, especially the fact that he's going to be the second best player on the team, mm-hmm. I don't think that that would catapult him into the GOAT conversation. So I don't even think yeah. he's in this conversation right now. Unless he got um, another MVP, that'd be crazy. Like if he, yeah, if he's if he all of a sudden just starts turning into that twenty twenty LeBron, then then now it's a little bit different. But I don't really see that happening. Mm-hmm. But I'm gonna say something different. I'm gonna say Jimmy Butler, just because <laughs> that would be a wild you, one if, too. Yeah. If you think about it, you think about it. They have they're playing seven undrafted players right now. They just beat the number one seed as the eighth seed. Regardless, Giannis hurt, cool, whatever. They still beat the number one seed. He like he's already known, at least for the player or the people in our generation who has watched him play, as undoubtedly one of the best playoff performers in this generation of players, just because just because of the step up that he takes from the regular season to the postseason. I mean, he would have had to go to the number one seed and had beat the Knicks, then had beat Boston, Sixers, whatever, mm-hmm. and goes to the finals, then had to beat what, Lakers, Golden State would already be a crazy, crazy finals between yeah. them two. If he if they play the Nuggets, they would have to beat the number one seed. Some say some miracle happens and the Suns make it out. That means he would have bit beat Kevin Durant, Devin Booker. So it's like, I mean, he cements himself as a Hall of Famer for sure. Mm-hmm. Which I feel like honestly right now he has a case that he's already a Hall of Famer. But that cements yeah. it one hundred percent. It's he'll one hundred percent get the finals MVP if he wins the finals. So that would probably make it go from people in our generation who watch him knowing that he's one of the best playoff performers to, like, people who look back 20-some years from now yep. looking back like, oh, no, Jimmy Butler, he was really that guy when it came to the playoffs. So I- I'll say Jimmy Butler. I feel like that's, a- that's an interesting one. No, that's a good one for sure because, like you said, he is definitely more low-key in the regular season. People watching now know what he's able to do as a playoff riser, but if he got some hardware to go along with that, that the run that he would have to go on now to go through Giannis, then a Knicks team, then either Tatum and Brown or Joel and James. And right. then who, whoever comes out of the West, there's names. Like if it's the Lakers, 
it has to be LeBron and AD or <laughs> right. Steph, Clay, and Dre or or Jokic and the whole Nuggets team in a one seed out west or KD and D book. Like that is a gauntlet to have run through mm-hmm. for a team that was three minutes away from not even making the playoff. <laughs> right, right, bro. And you know if they, he goes on this playoff run, that that means he's putting up crazy 35 plus 40 point games. So this like if he was was to go on this playoff run, it could be seen as one of the best playoff runs of all time. Just because of the way they would have to win would mean he would have to be the best player on the court in all of these series. Yep. Which is man, like cuz I th- I think right now like I said, I think say all right, say they beat the Knicks, say they lose to Boston, whoever. I still feel like 10, 15, 20 years down the line, people will remember Jimmy Butler, obviously, but they'll people who haven't watched him will probably be like, oh, yeah, he, he was a solid player. Like, he was a good player. And the only people who would really know about his switch between the regular season and the postseason will be people like us who actually watched him play. So right. if he was to go on a deep, like, finals run, win the finals, win finals MVP, I feel like that would cement him as, like, one of the best playoff performers ever. And people would remember him as far as looking back – 20 something years from now that would etch himself also as like he would get in that small group conversation of heat players like d wade alonzo morning like all for one ring but just because of how ridiculous it would be to attain um because like when you look back on it like lebron is Probably like not probably. LeBron is the best player to ever wear a Heat uniform, but mm-hmm. like D Wade is the best Miami Heat player. He's like, the greatest Heat player, yeah. Right. We know the distinction there because like mm-hmm. LeBron was the best, but like D Wade is Wade County for a reason, right? Right. Um, Jimmy would put himself into that same conversation. It's like, look what I just did for this franchise, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, definitely that would be a crazy one in terms of what that would do for him. That'd be wild. I'm just, I'm just like thinking of some of the names now in the playoff. Like, it's no <laughs> bad options, really. Like, everyone nah, stands so much to gain. It feels mm-hmm. like maybe more so than than prior years. Oh, um, as far as like what what you would gain from this championship, right? And I think it, some of that also is maybe just due to like how wide open it is because, um, in previous years, right, there has been like typically a clear cut favorite, and even if you go back to like. You know, the, the Cavs, Warriors years, where it was like every year we're seeing the same ones. Like, these type of conversations don't happen as much. But, like, there are people that are – there are definitely teams that are favorite when you look at, you know, like the Nuggets right out west, like how dominant they've been in the first two series. But everything is still pretty much up in the air. I don't think that there's a consensus clear-cut pick. Like, if I had to just put my money, it would not just be like a snap decision for me just like, oh, yeah, here's – Hunted on Denver or something like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that definitely plays into, you know, how many additional, how much additional, you know, legacy material people could gain off of, of getting a ring here. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. Man, I know you're not a legacy guy. For, for those who don't know, Billy's not a legacy guy. That's really, that's normally me. I'm normally the, the <laughs> all the top 10 this, you know, the arguing, debating on Twitter. That's, that's normally me. So yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely a, a different world as far as just talking about just actual like basketball and like what's going on in the league and stuff. So, which I feel like there, there's a time and a place for that, those debates and you know, the off season. Like, right, exactly. Yeah, there's a time and a place for that stuff. That's why I think it's funny when I see those like, like, bro, like even like after the game seven, this now Curry is top this. I'm like, bro, the playoff run didn't even like it's not done yet. There is like, more context to get added. Exactly. Like, bro, well, he what would happen? This- what would happen if he did that in game seven and then? They got swept in the next round. I was, just, I was just about to say that. Game. I was just about to say that. Like, bro, you got to let the playoff run finish before you can even start talking mm-hmm. about that. And sometimes I feel like um, it's not really fair to compare, like, these players that's playing right now. Besides, like, LeBron, I feel like his stuff is already cemented. Even, like, Steph to a, to a, de- a degree. But, like, mm-hmm. there's someone like Giannis. They compare them to, like, some of the greatest power forwards ever. I'm like, Giannis is – how is he, 28 – 29 so like Giannis yeah. is still somewhat young still some not I'm not gonna say early in his career but he's like in the middle of his 28 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's like he's not even going to have the numbers to – like, you don't know how his career is going to go from here. Like, God forbid, he could have an injury right now and just never play again. And, like, it's, it's just it, – the numbers aren't going to stack up. So I feel like we got to do – not us, but, like, the media in general or, like, mm-hmm. people on Twitter or whatever have to do a better job of, like, letting these players actually – accomplish more things finish out their career and like cement themselves before we just be quick to jump the gun on like is he top this is he better than this guy is he better than that guy so the the biggest outlets are always in my opinion way too quick to start the comparison talk Mm -hmm. and I I can only speak on you know whatever the last 20 years of watching ESPN right or Fox Sports whatever whoever's talking these like talk show debates right I don't know if this is how it was in the nineties, like when people comparing Jordan to people from the seventies or like, are we having these conversations then I wasn't there for it, but to me, it's, it's just too frequent and it always diminishes the now. Cause it always feels like you, I, somebody surpasses somebody that you, you know, from 20, 30 years ago or somebody that you grew up watching. That's like, okay, well then what's next? Well, okay. And you always feel like you can just like continue to ladder them up until it's like, Oh, well, are they ever going to be as good as Jordan? Are they ever going to be as good as Bill or Kareem or Shaq? Or like, at the end of the day, we just need to enjoy what we're watching now. Like, we're in the greatest era of basketball. And like, not everybody not, not, might not agree on that, but how much talent there is in the league, how much talent continues to come into the league is like, it is reaching ridiculous levels. Like, 20 years ago, and this is a little off topic, but 20 years ago, there is no world where DeMarcus Cousins is playing in Puerto Rico. No, absolutely not. Like, the fact that he isn't on an NBA roster, obviously it's partially due to injury and stuff like that, but some of that's just due to, like, bro, there's enough talent here that your services are not needed by anybody right now. They may be exactly. later, but, like, at this point in time, no one is taking a chance on that because there's other guys – there, but right? there's just as more talented people across the board. Mm-hmm. And it's only going to continue to get that way, you know, as this processing teams get better, as the game gets more global, right? Like the last five MVPs have all been international players. It's um, crazy to think about. Yeah. And I was on, I was on a spaces with, um, with Kenny Beecham. This was a while ago. And I asked him like, this was probably before, this was this season. It was like maybe probably like three months into the year. And I asked him like, you know, people were starting to try to form award races and every, like there was no, everything was so wide open. And I asked him, I was like, is a lot of that just due to um, like social media or more media presence or like how much of that is really just due to like players are better. And when you look back on even just this year's MVP race, like so much of the conversation, especially towards the end and it, rightfully so is like, all three of these players are well-deserving of the MVP. Like, all three of them had MVP caliber seasons. And if anybody had any of them as their MVP, I'm never going to sit here and knock any of those arguments. Like, I think Embiid was MVP, won the MVP. Cool. If you thought Yovic was MVP, also, I, I hear you. And I, I respect that because mm-hmm. I see why. If you think Giannis is it, it's the same way. Um, and so, like, the game getting more global – you have an even more international talent coming in. Like, it's just going to continue to get better and better and better. Um, it's like we're living in the best period of basketball and it's only going to continue to get better. And so, like, there's ways that you can acknowledge and honor, like, the past players without always making it this constant comparison between eras and this era was better than this era and this guy would have done this and this. Era. Like, Jordan played in the 90s. Jordan didn't play in 2023. And that's okay. And we can leave it at that. And right. same thing goes vice versa. LeBron played from 03 and he's still going all the way in 2023. He did not play 1987. It's cool, fun, whatever thing about what he would have done against the Bad Boy Pistons, but that is not something we'll ever see. And it's not it's a comparison that we need to be making <laughs> right. trying to base any all-time legacy matchups off of because it was a different time. There were different players. There were different rules. <laughs> when that stuff is going on versus how the NBA right. is played now. Right. I can't agree, can't agree more. I just I just feel like people need to enjoy, like you said, just living the moment more. I feel like me personally, 
the best thing I've ever done as a basketball fan cause, was to stop. I never hated players. I mean, I like I didn't really like LeBron growing up. I was a diehard Kobe fan. I didn't mm-hmm. really, as a kid, I didn't really like LeBron growing up. And all you hear is like debates. Like that's all you hear all day. The best thing I've ever done was to just like stop, witness this greatness, like enjoy this greatness, enjoy this great basketball. Like you're watching wherever you you have and wherever you have any of these players, Steph or whatever, just enjoy the fact that you're watching some of the greatest basketball ever, bro. You're watching some of the greatest players ever. Like, I was rooting for the Kings in that game seven. That doesn't just stop me from being like, bro, Steph is really just, this is amazing to watch. Like, bro, this is amazing to see, bro. Like, some people, people just have to stop the comparison sometimes and just enjoy basketball. But I also feel like not a lot of people actually like basketball. And that's a whole nother topic. I don't feel like a whole different people, episode. Yeah. That's a matter of fact, we can do we can talk about that next the next time. But I don't I feel like not a lot of people actually like basketball. And that's where the whole like I mean yeah. I think people like the drama. People like the mm-hmm. they get too the, deep into the fandom for a team or for a player and that like that skews your whole outlook on every other team, every other player, every other game. Like mm-hmm. you start viewing everything through the lens of being a LeBron fan, a Steph fan, a Nick fan, right? Like, it's the same thing, like, even when you're going and looking at other sports, like, why Cowboys fans can sometimes be so annoying because, like, bro, the world does not revolve around this team. <laughs> like, I know yeah. that they're always on ESPN, and as a Cowboys fan myself, I can openly say, like, bro, Cowboys fans are annoying because <laughs> everything somehow is about the Cowboys, and it doesn't have to be that way. You, like, yeah. you can appreciate everything else going on and still be a fan of your team and still support, like, but it doesn't have to skew how you view everything else. Yeah. Couldn't agree more, man. Yeah, I'm gonna say that's that's a whole nother I gotta write yeah. that down because now that's a whole nother topic, man. Yeah. That seemed yeah. like a good place to leave it, man. Just enjoy mm. enjoy the game that's about to come on today. All right, we got Nick's heat about to start here in an hour, and then you know, game three of Lakers Warriors. So just enjoy the fact that we are in the best era of basketball right now. So, all right. All right. We're going to leave it with that. As always, this is the Off the Glass podcast. I'm Billy. That's Dame. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Watch the shorts. Follow the TikTok. Follow the socials. Um, we appreciate all the support as always. And we out. Peace. Yes, sir.